So hi everyone. Yesterday on our panel, we talked a little bit about the need for a systems approach to solving some of the challenges that come along with AI and these emerging applications. Today, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. But first, you know, thanks to GSA for arranging this event. I, when I look out here, I see so much experience, right? There's a lot of people in this room, you know, 20, 30 years or more of experience in the industry. And I want to ask you, have you ever seen a time in your career where there are so many things changing at one time? For me, it's been like 22 years, and I haven't seen this yet. Right now, we're going through a period where we're trying to re-architect our supply chains, and at the same time, adapt to this demand that, that we're seeing in end markets. It's driving complete changes in who the customers are and what they need. You know, on the supply side, we have costs of everything rising exponentially. You know, if you look at the cost to design an advanced node chip, it's like 500 million to a billion dollars now. If you look at the cost to build a fab, 25, 30 billion dollars. You know, we all know the, the price of EUV tools and so on. So everything's getting more expensive. And that's driving a lot of concentration in the industry. Every layer of our supply chain, if you really dig down into it, there's a dangerous single point of failure at every single layer, right? Whether that's equipment, whether that's foundry, whether it's AI chips, we're overly dependent on single companies and single regions at each level of the stack. And so I think everyone in this room recognizes that we need to make our supply chains more resilient, right? It's been a common theme across a lot of the other uh, presentations as well. I think everyone also well recognizes, and Europe has long been a leader in this, that climate change is happening, and we're probably not doing as much as we should be doing just yet to go and change that. And so all of us in this room are looking at how do I make my supply chain more resilient and more sustainable. On the demand side, you know, we have this entirely structural shift that's happening. You know, the whole industry for foundry is set up around mobile. You know, the way it's been working since the iPhone came out is mobile customers get to define the process technology. Mobile customers get to define what packaging technology is there. Mobile customers get first access to the capacity. Everyone else has to wait in line. But now we're seeing this emergence of uh, this transformation from AI and especially in the cloud data centers and automotive with the re-architecturing of automotive systems. And that's driving a new class of customers and it's driving a change in how we design chips and systems. So on the customer front, you know, what the end customers are seeing is that the chips that are in the market today don't necessarily meet the needs of this application and where it's going. So they're vertically integrating, right? And that can take the form of auto OEMs getting more involved in their supply chain and shepherding it. It could you know, take the form of auto uh, fabulous companies that once focused on very mature nodes going down to the more advanced nodes so they can adapt to some of these changes, you know, with computer vision and centralized architectures. And this is driving a whole new class of customers. So if you looked at the combination of the auto and the hyperscalers, the people that are vertically integrating, so to speak, you know, five years ago, it would have been a very small portion of demand that comes from vertical integrators. It would have been almost zero. Now, by the end of the decade, it'll be at least 10% of the industry on advanced nodes will come from these kind of vertical integrators. So this whole new class of customers emerging. And because of these new applications, this re-architecting of the systems, and this new class of customers as well, we're seeing a whole new approach to chip design. And so what used to once be the unit of compute is a single piece of silicon is now shifted to multiple pieces of silicon in a package and multiple of those packages connected together. And that's true in auto, it's true in mobile, it's true in HPC, it's true across a wide variety of applications. And a big part of that is chiplets. And so I use the chiplet term broadly here, meaning you know, multiple dies in a single package, whether those are connected in you know, a two and a half D fashion, where they're adjacent to each other, or whether they're three D stacked, or some combination thereof, which we call three and a half D. The advanced nose wafers that go into packages like that will actually surpass the number of wafers that are going into monolithic dyes, you know, monolithic dyes going into a package by 2028. So kind of chiplets are taking over. And while there's still a lot of talk about how do we make those modular and get you know, different vendors to be able to put the same thing into a package, that's going really, really slowly because it's really hard. You know, we still see most of the chiplets in a package coming from a single vendor, and we think that's going to continue for a little while until we get better standards and um, we find the common denominator of chiplets that we can build to go and enable these multi-chip packages in a more modular fashion. But for now, 
you know, it's going to grow, but it's going to be heavily concentrated in kind of single source, um, you know, places making their own set of chip lists, all the chip lists in the package coming from one company. So we have this big structural shift in customer demand, and we have the re-architecting of supply chains at the same time. And so let's look at using an AI example, because AI is the most, you know, data center AI is the most convenient, well-published example. So I'll kind of tell the story through that lens, and then I'll tie it into what it means for auto and other things later. But if you look at the projections, everyone's pretty clear. It's going to be big, right? No one knows exactly how big or how fast. We're all going to be wrong about whatever our projections are. But the numbers I generally see you know, across all the research papers out there are somewhere between 2 and 4x growth per year in the amount of compute that's needed. And you know, if you look at Moore's Law, it's doubling every two years, right? So if you go 3x in one year, that's six times the rate of Moore's Law. So how do we go and catch up with those improvements? And so this particular paper here happened from Epoch AI shows, you know, like, what is it, 60 years, it's going to grow exponentially. So whether that's true or not, I don't know, but let's look at the very near term. And we're at the very bottom left, by the way, where it's just starting. If you look at the very near term, where it's, let's say, 10 years, and you're growing 3x per year, that's 60,000 times improvement that you need in the next 10 years in terms of the number of compute flops that are available. And in the last 10 years, you know, Bill Daly at last year's Hot Chips from NVIDIA, he presented a paper that showed the last 10 years rate of improvement was 1,000x over 10 years. So we're off by a factor of 60. So how can we get there? Let's look at some of the challenges that we have and then kind of talk about how do we get around these. So last year, there was a really great paper that I love from Google. They introduced this concept called model flops utilization. So if you take all of the compute flops that are in a system and you add them up, that's kind of the entitlement of what you should be able to expect to be able to use. And then they compare that to what you can actually use when you run through these large language models at scale. And that gives you this kind of efficiency metric. And when they looked at you know, things like ChatGPT and other kind of uh, large language models that are out there today running on the, you know, the dominant systems in the industry, what they found is you're only able to actually use 30% of the compute you have in a system. And the reason for that is largely because of this. So if you look at the gray line, you have the amount of flops that you have growing pretty dramatically. And then if you look at the, the green and the blue lines, they're much shallower slope. And this is kind of limiting what the system can actually produce. And you know, it's the fact that the memory and the networking and the compute are not in harmony and they're not optimized for the system that kind of limits that efficiency and limits how much we can get out of our existing systems and compounds the difficulty of getting to um, the kind of improvement that we need that, to see. The other challenge I think has been talked about by pretty much everyone is power. So I won't I'll go into it too much, but if you just take the number of server AI chips that will ship next year, and you turn them all on for half the time, you get uh, more power consumption than 60% of countries in the world. And you take those chips, you put them into a system, then all of a sudden you're at three times the power consumption of the entire United Kingdom. And if you think about that last two charts ago when I showed that 50 years of exponential growth and us being in the very bottom left, so we're, we're only just getting started and already we're so far away from a scalable and sustainable path to commercializing AI. So what can we do about it? If we look across all the different research papers that are out there, there's been so much thought put into this. And this is not you know, my idea. This is kind of a summary of the, the different big trends I see, at least in the industry, that the leaders in, in this space are considering. So the very first step is at the bottom, system technology co-optimization. It's basically taking those very shallow slope lines of, of memory and DRAM and bringing them up closer to the, the compute line. So everything's kind of more in harmony, more in sync. You know, there's several papers about the effects of doing this and what kind of benefits it can lead to. But the best one, I think, is from Google. That same uh, model flops utilization paper essentially shows that if you take the same technology, not even like the next generation of it, the same technologies, and you just put them into a system more cleverly where things are in balance, then you will get like a 10x kind of improvement. That's without even improving anything. Just, just connect things in a better way that's better mapped to software. You get 10x improvement. OK, so that's step one. That's the system technology co-optimization. And then while you're doing that, you might as well evolve like we always have with Moore's Law and packaging, right? So you go to the next process node. You go to the next HBM standard. 
Then you take that and you go to bigger package sizes. You put more dyes next to each other in 2.5D. You stack more dyes on top of each other in 3D, and you put all that in one 3.5D package together. And that gets you, let's say, another 10x, and that's multiplicative, right? So you get to like 10x times 10x, you get 100x from those first two layers of the stack. That's not nowhere close to where we need to get, right? So what do we do next? You know, you have to look at being more efficient in your calculations. So today, most of the calculations work on floating point of some sort, in training at least. And you have to take from those 16 bits or more, 32 bits, and go down, and there's papers from Microsoft and other leaders that show you only really need two bits eventually to be able to do this effectively. So if you get down to two bits to do the calculation, all of a sudden you have an eight or a 16x improvement in the amount of compute you have. But oh, everything has to be in balance, right? So you improve your compute by 16x, you gotta go and improve your memory and, and your networking by at least the same amount, otherwise you get back to that problem that we saw on the previous page. So what has to happen? You have to go to things like potentially new memories. You have to go to optical interconnects. And then you have to try to make the models more efficient as well. And so if you do all of these things, there's a path to get to 1,000x-ish. And so we're still kind of at that limit of 1,000x-ish. And so we have to get, find a way somehow to get to 60. And so beyond this, we have to get 60x more out of this, right? So beyond this, there's going to be new things that happen. Like, for example, when you go down to two bits, does that now open up an avenue where you know, analog computing makes sense or something like that? So this, this is going to continue to go up and up and up. But I think the main point is you have to optimize every level of the system if you want to get even close to what's needed. And that's why when you look at a lot of the next generation chips, and this is just a generic model that we have, right? But a lot of the next generation AI chips look roughly like this. They're really huge packages, you know, 100 by 100, 200 by 200. They have lots of memory in there, whether it's 2.5D connected through HBM, or it's you know, underneath the CPU uh, and AI accelerators, you know, they're stacked SRAM and so on. And then you have I.O. tiles separately, so you can have your I.O. advancing at a different rate and on a more cost-effective process node than your, than your uh, compute. Um, and then you take all of those system into packages and you connect them together with a really efficient interconnect. And so now what you have is you have what used to be a server in a single package, and then you have what used to be a rack in a single server, and then you connect all those racks together with a really efficient interconnect, and you have a data center that effectually, effectively looks like a single computer in terms of how efficient it is at moving data around and doing calculations. And so this is kind of where the industry is going. And if you look at what it takes to get there, traditionally it's been the bottom row of this chart, right? You go forward the next generation of process technology. Now it takes every level of this chart to go and get there. You have to be able to have that, those complex packaging for 3.5D and, and 2D and keep evolving those. You have to be able to put these on really large substrates. You have to be able to cool it. You know, these things are 1,500, 2,000 watts in the next generation and, and even more after that. And you have to have all the different interconnect technologies and memory technologies to be able to put these things so they're all working in harmony together. And then, oh, by the way, it all has to work really well with software and has to kind of all be mapped together. And so that's why this whole systems approach is a critical way to get to you know, the orders of magnitude improvement that we need. And so I've told, sort of told this story through the lens of data center AI because there's a lot of published research on it and I'm not going to get in trouble for saying things that are said by someone else first. Um, but the same thing is happening in every other industry. You saw in some of the other presentations, the same theme, system approach, su supply chain resiliency, sustainability. It's true in automotive as well, right? As you move from you know, these decentralized architectures where you have lots of you know, very mature, specialized chips uh, spread throughout the vehicle to the more centralized architectures where you have computer vision and centralized compute and zone controllers and all of these kind of things. It's the same kind of problem, just with a different flavor to it, right? You need, you need the networking capability. You need the AI capability. You have to balance the networking and the memory and everything else together. It's the same systems approach. And so, and then finally, you have to make sure you can deliver all those things you know, in a resilient and sustainable way to your customers, right? We all know that AI is gonna be central to everything we do, so we really have to make sure that when we go through all this work of optimizing the whole system, it actually gets to the end customers reliably and in a way that doesn't boil our planet. So what 
I'd like to say is in closing, I think every one of us should ask ourselves, where are we gonna get the capabilities to go and make these full system solutions? And is my supply chain reliable enough? Is my supply chain sustain sustainable enough? I really think this last part of sustainability is not getting enough attention, right? We keep saying, okay, 2040, we're gonna do this, 2040, we're gonna do that, 2050, we're gonna do this. I think we all need to ask our suppliers, what did you do now? What did you do last year? How much renewable energy did you use last year to run your fabs? We have to start making this more important in our decision criteria. So I hope all of you think more about this and actually go and take some action on it right away. So thank you very much.